Okay, let's start off by seeing if you've been paying attention. Okay. Starting with squids. Okay, squids are predators and uh, they're also capable of much higher levels of locomotory performance. They're smarter, they're stronger compared to other kinds of mollusks, other non cephalopod mollusks that um, have different ecologies like gastropods and bivalves. Okay. Uh, we uh, tied that to the fact that cephalopods have closed circulatory systems. And now the question is, well, what's the difference? What do squids get from their closed circulatory systems that bivalves and gastropods are not getting from their open systems? Next question. We know that insects are capable of powered flight which is a highly demanding activity. It, uh, it, it requires really high metabolic rates. Okay? Now, insects also have open circulatory systems, which would seem to make it unlikely for insects to be able to achieve those high metabolic rates as required for powered flight. And yet insects do. And we know that this is tied to the insect's tracheal system, the fact that all their muscles are linked to the outside air through a system of very fine tubules. Okay? And so the question is, well, what is it that's provided by the tracheal system that's not being delivered by the open circulatory system that allows the insects to elevate their metabolic rates to the point where they're able to actually get airborne and be really, really good flyers. Okay. The answer, of course, is oxygen. When you consider insects, you, you'll realize how much more important oxygen is than even the nutrients. Obviously, the nutrients uh, provided by the insect's diet and digestive system being served to all the muscles via the open circulatory system they're not really limiting the metabolic activity, the metabolic potential of the muscles. It's oxygen, right? Uh, the tracheal system is not providing uh, glucose or other nutrients to the muscles. It's only providing the oxygen. And from this, we take home the idea that oxygen really is the most important constraint when it comes to defining the uh, maximum metabolic capacity of an organism. All right, so sorry for blinding you with that color scheme, but I needed to have something more interesting visually than just a blank screen while I went through that little scree. Okay. Um, now, in terms of how oxygen gets most effectively delivered to the tissues, uh, it requires us to consider the importance of respiratory pigments. And while there's a diversity of respiratory pigments in use by different members of the animal kingdom, the one that we'll be focusing on is hemoglobin. HB is the abbreviation. Now to understand hemoglobin, we're going to build a molecule of hemoglobin up from the core elements. Uh, first of all, in order to interact with oxygen, in order to attach and detach to oxygen, a globin-related pigment requires an atom of iron. Other kinds of organisms might be using other metals. For example, copper can be used in some of the arthropod uh, pigments, but iron is the pigment that's being used in the globin family of molecules and so this is the one we're going to be focusing on. Okay, Now metals are elements that are relatively loose with their electron configurations. They can take on different oxidation reduction states in which they're able to adhere more strongly or less strongly to other things like a molecule of oxygen. Okay? Iron is doing exactly that and our iron atom in each globin chain is being held in place by this thing called a heme ring. It involves nitrogen atoms. Nitrogen atoms are holding the iron in place. Okay, we've got covalent bonds with the nitrogen atoms, and the nitrogen atoms are basically part of a structure. We've got an organic structure. There's a carbon at each one of these corners, and we've got this um, ring-shaped structure that's actually a pretty large thing as far as molecules go, but it's not nearly as large as the actual protein on, on its own. Okay. This heme ring is related to similar structures that we find in molecules like chlorophyll. Uh, chlorophyll has got a porphyrin ring, basically the same structure with a magnesium on the inside. And so these pigments that bear transition metals in their interior are often going to involve this type of organic ring-like motif. Okay. And this heme finds itself in the context of a protein. There's a protein that helps this thing in place. And you've got alpha helices and you've got beta pleated sheets. more alpha helices, more beta pleated sheets. Basically, you've got this complex structure. This, this overall thing that we're drawing here is a three-dimensional structure of a polypeptide. This would be a globin chain. 
it takes its form and part of the uh, final structure of the globin chain is that it holds on its structure a heme ring as kind of like an added on feature be above and beyond what's normally there with the amino acids okay so the globin chain is the basic protein based unit that allows hemoglobin to pick up an oxygen oxygen comes in it can either attach to the hemoglobin basically on the iron that's there in the heme ring or could not attach the hemoglobin and that's how oxygen gets carried by molecules like hemoglobin okay. now your typical molecule of hemoglobin consists of four chains four of these globin chains two alpha chains and two beta chains and so the actual quaternary structure of the protein um, has two chains, two of these alpha chains, and two of the beta chains, and these uh, and this overall structure is going to have a quaternary structure that is not only uh, having four proteins, it's also going to have four hemes on it. And so this elaborate structure of hemoglobin can carry as many as four molecules of oxygen, one here, one here, one here, and one here. It can carry three, it can carry two, it can carry one, or none at all. And hemoglobin's trick is its ability to adhere to oxygen and hold on to it very tightly under some circumstances and not hold on to it at all under other circumstances. Okay. We call the state of oxygen carrying by hemoglobin the saturation. Okay. Uh, we can go from completely associated, we can carry as many as four molecules of oxygen, three, two, one, no molecules of oxygen. And so Oxygen saturation ranges from 0 to 4. Okay? Now when hemoglobin goes in the upward direction, when it goes from a lower state of saturation to a higher state of saturation, we would call this oxygen association. While we call the opposite process, when oxygen is being unloaded from the hemoglobin, we call that dissociation. And both of these phenomena association and dissociation are associated with a phenomenon called cooperativity which refers to the tendency of hemoglobin to swing completely over towards association or dissociation and spending relatively little time in these intermediate levels of saturation and the main determinant as to whether hemoglobin is going to swing towards saturation becoming oxyhemoglobin or on the other end of the spectrum we've got deoxyhemoglobin depends on the atmosphere or the milieu in which the hemoglobin molecule finds itself. Okay. Now this might sound weird to you, but milieu is actually, a, well it is a French word, but it's used in the English language to refer to the atmosphere or climate um, surrounding, immediately surrounding uh, an entity of interest. Okay. And so uh, when we talk about the milieu of a hemoglobin molecule, we're talking about how much oxygen there is around it. What's the partial pressure of oxygen in the uh, plasma or whatever fluid is surrounding the hemoglobin molecule. Okay. Now if the milieu is oxygen rich, then hemoglobin swings all the way in the direction towards oxyhemoglobin. We basically pick up oxygens at a very fast rate. What happens is that the shape or conformation of the hemoglobin molecules is changing in response to attaching to oxygen. When you attach one oxygen, it takes on a stronger affinity for oxygen. And then when it attaches the second one, the affinity grows even stronger. And pretty soon you've got a complete load of four molecules of oxygen. Okay. On the other hand, when we start to unload the hemoglobin of its oxygen under oxygen poor conditions, uh, that loaded hemoglobin molecule might shake off a single oxygen and that caused the hemoglobin to lose its affinity for the oxygens. And pretty soon you have all the oxygens that have completely fallen off the molecule. And this phenomenon of cooperativity is, is at the core of a lot of the uh, apparently magic properties of some proteins. They, they change their shape and have these interesting behaviors as a result of things like changes to their conformation in response to the milieu. Now there's a really super important uh, graphic that everybody who takes a class like this has got to completely understand. Um, on the x-axis we've got the the milieu or the oxygen partial pressure and it's going to range from low a very oxygen poor environment on the left hand side and as we move to the right it's going to shift towards higher and higher levels of oxygen. 
And on the y-axis, we're going to have a saturation of the hemoglobin, the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin, ranging from 100% oxyhemoglobin, that's where all the molecules have four oxygens on them. At the other end, at the bottom, we'll have 100% deoxyhemoglobin, where all of the molecules of hemoglobin are carrying no oxygen at all. Okay. In the default situation, you would expect under a situation where you've got ex exactly no interesting behaviors on the part of a molecule of hemoglobin would be a relatively diagonal line. The more oxygen you have around you, the more oxygen you'll be attaching to. But hemoglobin is not boring. It's got this phenomenon of cooperativity. We're saying here is that our hemoglobin is going to be mostly in either one of two separate states, either mostly oxyhemoglobin or mostly deoxyhemoglobin, right? And so under conditions of relatively low oxygen partial pressures, we would have primarily deoxyhemoglobin, right? And when we reach a certain point, when we reach a certain uh, level of oxygen in the milieu, we're going to start to associate those oxygen molecules, and it's going to happen very, very rapidly, right? And then once we get up to close to 100% saturation is going to slow down. So basically once we get to this level of, of oxygen partial pressure, the uh, we'll be pretty much at 100% saturation of oxyhemoglobin. Okay? And this S-shaped curve is what we want to associate with the association curve of oxygen on hemoglobin. Right? Now what we're seeing here in this middle section where we've got the relatively steep uphill and downhill a bit is that all you know, and the molecules of hemoglobin that are migrating out into a high oxygen milieu they're going to be attaching to oxygen very very rapidly that's why the slope becomes really steep conversely if you have a molecule of hemoglobin moving into a lower oxygen milieu it's going to be unloading offloading its oxygen very very rapidly when we think about it, this is exactly what we need to happen in the circulatory system of an animal where the blood is moving back and forth between areas where oxygen is very rich, like the lungs, okay, and areas where oxygen is very poor, like in the muscle tissue where we're going to be consuming oxygen in order to carry out metabolic activity, right? So your blood molecules, every time your blood circulates, it goes back and forth continuously between a high oxygen milieu, that's the area of the lungs, it gets circulated out to the systemic circuit where it goes to low oxygen milieu, and it's delivering the oxygen to these low oxygen tissues very, very effectively because of this tendency of cooperative binding of oxygen. So this is the oxygen association curve, just like the one I showed you before. Um, a little bit neater because I didn't draw it by hand. And have pretty much gone over everything that we need to go over here. What I want to share with you though is this curve here. And the point of this curve is that there's actually a variety of different kinds of hemoglobin. It's not that all hemoglobin is the same, right? Uh, in the case of humans we've got fetal hemoglobin, maternal hemoglobin. We actually have several different stages of fetal hemoglobin that a baby goes through in utero before it's born. Okay, and then after a baby is born, all the hemoglobin turns into the same hemoglobin that we have throughout the rest of our lives. Okay? Now looking at the fetal hemoglobin and the maternal hemoglobin, here you'll note that the oxygen association is always higher in the case of fetal hemoglobin relative to the maternal hemoglobin. And you want to ask yourself, well, why is that? What's the adaptive significance of having fetal hemoglobin with a stronger affinity for oxygen compared with maternal hemoglobin? And the answer is pretty straightforward, right? In mammals, fetuses have to get their oxygen from mother circulation. There is an interface at the placenta where the fetal blood comes very close to the maternal blood. And right there, as the bloods are passing very close to each other, we need to have the maternal blood offloading its hemoglobin into the fetal blood. And that's absolutely crucial to keep that fetus going. All right. Now, another interesting curve on this graph is the hemoglobin, this is the normal adult hemoglobin of the animal known as a yama, okay? Or if you prefer, a llama, okay? So if you don't know what a llama is, it's a high altitude camel that you find in South America, right? If you go to Bolivia, in the highlands, what you'll find are a whole bunch of camels that are walking around, they're used as draft animals. There's actually a llama farm in the Owens Valley right off the 395, just past Lone Pine, I think. There's a llama ranch. Okay. And, uh, and what we're noticing here is that the llama's hemoglobin, even as an adult, has got an even stronger affinity for oxygen compared to even the human fetus, right? Human fetuses were kind of like oxygen hogs. Llamas are even stronger oxygen hogs, 
Okay. And, uh, and what do you think about that? Why would a llama need a variety of hemoglobin that's got a really strong affinity for oxygen? Well, yeah, it's, it lives at extremely high altitudes where the partial pressures of oxygen are extremely low. Not that it represents a lower percentage of the air, it's just that there's far less air to begin with. Okay, 21% of air at a density of 50% of where it is at sea level is still giving you only half the oxygen compared to the same composition of air at sea level. Okay, And living in such an oxygen stress environment means that a llama is going to need all the help it can get to acquire oxygen from its world. Okay. Now the last thing to note on this graph is the myoglobin, the, uh, the blue line at the very top, which has got the strongest oxygen affinity of all the molecules that are there. The difference is that hemoglobin is a molecule that circulates. Myoglobin is a respiratory pigment that stays put. It stays in the muscle cells or in the fat cells. Remember brown fat? Okay. It stays right there in the cells into which the oxygen is going to have to be loaded from the hemoglobin, from the hemoglobin that's circulating, right? Myoglobin is a different molecule. It's actually related to hemoglobins, and this actually brings up another interesting story. I like to think of myoglobin as the original oxygen harvesting pigment. Okay. Compared to myoglobin, hemoglobin is a relatively recent uh, elaboration. You could say that once we became large enough to require a circulatory system, we needed some way of effectively harvesting oxygen from the circulating medium when it came into our areas. And so having a respiratory pigment like myoglobin in our cells was probably a very good idea even from the very earliest animals that were using circulatory systems. Okay? And so if you sort of visualize the original gene for myoglobin, somewhere on a chromosome, so this is a chromosome someplace in our ancestral animal, um, maybe there's at some point a gene for myoglobin. Now from this starting point we have the development of what we call a gene family. And this starts off as a relatively rare mutational event in which we're not really making a change to the myoglobin gene, we're just duplicating it. We're making two copies that sit in tandem array. So we've got a tandem duplication of myoglobin, so we've got two identical copies, A and B, sitting right next to each other on the chromosome. Now once we have that first tandem duplication, we basically create a very tiny gene family. That tandem duplication opens the door for uh, further events that make it considerably easier to increase the size of our growing family. And this occurs because of the events that occur during meiosis, the formation of a tetrad and the occurrence of crossing over. Now normally the uh, chromosomes line up perfectly A with A and B with B, but because we've got identical genes, the cells forming the tetrad will make an occasional mistake in which we might attempt to pair up the B gene of one chromosome with the A gene of the other chromosome. And if you happen to get a crossing over event in that space right there, one of these meiotic products is only going to have one copy of the original gene, but one of the other meiotic products is going to have three. Now if that chromosome carrying three duplicates of the original gene becomes a standard version of the chromosome that we have in the species, our gene family, our, our globin gene family has grown to a grand total of three copies. Right? And so this process continues. We end, up with, uh, we end up with chromosomes that have many tandem copies of the original gene, not only that, we know that in vertebrates we've had at least two events of whole genome duplication, which has led to the evolution of new chromosomes in the genome that derive from the original chromosome that had the globin gene family. Not all those extra chromosomes have been kept over the course of evolutionary time, but some have. Okay? And so in the case of modern vertebrates, we actually have two globin family of genes that are exclusively hemoglobin genes. These are the gene families that contain things like the alpha and the beta globin subunits that go into the structure of an adult human hemoglobin, but it also gives rise to other things like gammas and deltas and epsilons. I'm not doing these things in exact, uh, in exact order. I don't remember what the orientation is of the globin genes in the hemoglobin family of the human chromosome. And fetal hemoglobins are different from adult hemoglobins because they're being put together with different basic polypeptides. Once we're born we're pretty much only expressing the alpha and the beta, but, but, but while we're fetuses we're using these other genes in the globin gene family. Right? 
So in addition to these genes that are functional at some point in the development of an animal, we also have in typical gene families, we also have these genes that are that are never turned on. They're basically extra copies that are not needed at all. They become places that can accumulate mutations with no penalty whatsoever, and we call these pseudogenes, which we usually uh, symbolize with the Greek letter psi, P-S-I. Okay. I think it's a pretty cool thing to realize and understand why we have these pseudogenes, right? We've got this history of gene duplications and the creation of a fairly large gene family. And some of those extra copies of genes became really important parts to the development of the animal, right? Um, the Korean geneticist Susumu Ono uh, was the first person to suggest that this uh, process of gene duplication was an important feature in the evolution of diversity and complexity in, uh, in the history of life. Okay, and we now know that to be exactly true, right? Um, these gene families, they grow in size as a result of random events of tandem duplication and genome duplication. We don't plan the futures of every one of these genes. Some of them may become useful and some of them might become totally trash. Now our hemoglobin molecules get loaded into red blood cells. And the red blood cells pass through capillaries. They come very close to some type of respiratory medium. Okay? And uh, in the case of fishes, you might remember from our laboratory, we looked at the basic structure of that countercurrent exchange that occurred in the fish's gills. Right? The fish's gill filaments are flared out when water is being pumped across the capillaries. The capillaries themselves are acquiring oxygen as they pass from one edge of the gill filament to the other edge of the gill filament. That's the part, that's the part right there where we have water flowing in the opposite direction. Water from the mouth cavity is passing across the gill filaments all the, on the way to the outside of the fish through the operculum. Okay. And it's at that juncture we've got the water flowing in one direction, passing really close to the, to the blood flowing through the capillaries. And as the capillaries are flowing in this direction to the left, we're going to be seeing that blood become progressively more oxygenated. And so by the time we get to the front edge of the gill filament and carry that blood back to the gill arch, it's going to be fully oxygenated. The entire length of this passage, the entire length of this countercurrent exchange, uh, is only the width of a single gill filament, less than a millimeter overall. And yet that's the distance that's required in order for us to get very effective oxygen transfer from the water, from the ventilating water, into the blood. Okay, uh, Presumably it wouldn't work nearly as well if the blood and the water were flowing in the same direction. Now one mistake that a lot of people make is to try to compare air breathing with water breathing. Because if you're a fish breathing water, you're kind of limited to the total amount of dissolved oxygen that's there in the water that you're swimming through. And dissolved oxygen is never going to reach the same percentages that we find in the composition of air, right? Air today has got 21% oxygen. There's no way you could make a solution of oxygen in water that would be 21%. Aqueous solutions become totally saturated with oxygen at a much, much lower level. But that doesn't mean that air is necessarily that much better of a medium to be breathing relative to water, right? Think about the amazing things that a swordfish or marlin can do. It's metabolically active. Tunas have incredibly high metabolic activity and they're breathing water. Okay? Saying that the oxygen content of water is less than 1% compared to 21% in the air you don't want to be saying that. That's not a fair comparison. Okay? When we breathe air, it's really a different story because we've got a respiratory surface. This might be the, uh, the surface of the alveolus. And, and on this side, we'll have the air space, of the air that's contiguous with the outside world because we breathe the air in from the outside. And then we'll have the capillaries that are running on the inside of this, right? So the capillaries are over here. And the red blood cells are tumbling along, tumbling along in this pulmonary capillary. So we're faced with the task of having oxygen that's there as one of the components of the gas in the mixture inside the alveolus to get into the red blood cells where we'll be attaching to oxygen. Okay. Now just like in the airspace of a leaf, we require a wet interface for the exchange of gases. We require a wet interface on the interior surfaces of the alveoli in order for us to get gas exchanges across that surface as well. Right, oxygen from the airspace of the leaf has got to go into solution in that aqueous layer. And then once it's in solution over here, it can diffuse 
into the spaces in between the surface of the alveolus and the uh, blood vessel. And then we go across the endothelial lining of the blood vessel, the capillary. It gets into the plasma, and from there it gets into the red blood cells where it attaches to the hemoglobin. Okay, And so this traffic of, of gases goes from the airspace into the aqueous layer, uh, diffusing into other aqueous layers, diffusing across into another aqueous layer, and then going into the aqueous solution inside of a cell where it gets picked up by the hemoglobin, and that's the pathway of oxygen. Okay? Now one of the principal determinants of how rapidly this oxygen is going to be moving from the airspace into the aqueous layer. Um, one of the determinants here is going to be the total partial pressure, the total concentration of oxygen that we have inside of this airspace. Okay? So if this is high, if we have high O2, we're going to get a lot more rapid uptake of oxygen into the uh, alveolar lining. Uh, we'll have a much more rapid uptake into the hemoglobin molecules, ultimately in the red blood cells in the pulmonary capillaries. On the other hand, if the airspace inside the alveolus had a much lower concentration of oxygen, if we had a lower percentage, that's going to result in a lower rate of oxygen uptake. And so this is going to be the starting point for our comparison between the respiratory systems of mammals and birds, because there's a real significant difference between mammals and birds in terms of how able they are at loading the air spaces in their lungs with air mixtures containing higher versus lower partial pressures of oxygen. Now we're going to start on the familiar side with the anatomy of the mammalian respiratory tree. And so what we have here is a photograph of, uh, of a rubber casting of a pair of human lungs. Okay? You know, the morbid story behind this picture is that at some point somebody had to die. And, uh, and their corpse was donated to science. And what they did with this person's lungs was that they filled the lung spaces with latex, with rubber. And you basically pump in as much rubber as the lungs will hold, and then you uh, allow the, uh, the rubber to solidify. And then you put it into some kind of solution that will melt away the, uh, the, the lung meat, uh, leaving the rubber behind. Okay. And, uh, and what, we're, what we've done here is we've shown, uh, like outside of the tan box, We've got all of the air spaces in the lungs in full glory. And on the uh, and inside the box, we're seeing the basic structure of the respiratory tree itself. How the bronchi split into bronchioles, splitting into even smaller bronchioles, eventually terminating in some type of alveolus. Right. And so again, we've got the trachea, which is a windpipe that connects the two bronchi. And the bronchi uh, then move out into the lung area where you've got bronchioles splitting up further and finer into finer and finer and finer spaces. Basically, this is the, uh, this is the bulk of what we have in the case of your typical human lung. Now, one thing to note about the mammalian anatomy of the respiratory tree is that the air comes in and out of the lungs the same pathway. Basically, air goes in, down the trachea, out the bronchi, out the bronchioles, out in this way, and then it goes back out in the same pathway. But it's, it's basically an in and out, in and out sort of thing as we breathe air, right? Um, this basically creates a constraint. There's no way, for example, that we can ever empty the lungs. Okay? The, uh, the lungs require at least some residual volume because if we were to collapse the lungs entirely, if we were to get rid of all the air spaces in the lungs, we would never be able to fill our lungs again because it would be so hard to break the surface tension inside the alveoli. We do that only once in our lives. It's called the very first breath. And after you fill your lungs with air for the very first time, uh, from that point forward, your lungs are going to be retaining some air in them at all times for the rest of your life. Now, as a consequence of this uh, in and out circulation, we're never able to put freshly ventilated air in the alveoli, or for that matter, even in most of these really fine bronchioles closer to the outside portion of the respiratory tree. At most, we're typically ventilating between 30 and 60 percent of all the volume that we have in our respiratory system. With a normal breath, you're probably ventilating only 30 percent. With a very, very deep breath, you might be able to ventilate as much as 60 or 70 percent. Okay, and so if you think about, if we, if we simplify this overall pattern of the respiratory tree going all the way out to an alveolus, if we, if we draw that as like a continual tube, you would basically have the front part of the alveolus being served by bulk flow of air. Basically, it's only to that point where we'll actually potentially get fresh air moving in and out of the respiratory tree. Okay? 
the deeper portions of the respiratory tree going all the way out to the alveoli are going to have the same air in them the whole time. We're never going to be able to get fresh air into the deeper portions of the respiratory tree. Okay? And so for us to actually get oxygen in the air spaces of the respiratory tree where it's actually breathed in from the outside, in order for the oxygen to get out to the alveoli where you've got gas exchange occurring in the capillaries, this is going to require simple diffusion. We ventilate our respiratory trees down to a certain point and from that point onwards it's only simple diffusion that's going to be uh, providing oxygen to the termini of this type of respiratory anatomy. Now diffusion is a process that always requires a concentration gradient. We might have 21% oxygen out here in the portion of the respiratory tree that gets ventilated, but over here on the alveolar end it's got to be substantially lower than that. It's got to be much lower than that because we rely on diffusion to provide continual flow of oxygen from the upper respiratory tree down to the deeper parts. Okay? Now what this means is that the airspace inside the alveolus is probably going to be more like on the lower end. I don't know exactly what it is. It probably varies depending on where you are in the respiratory tree. The alveoli close to the bases of the respiratory tree are probably going to get a higher concentration of oxygen compared to the alveoli that are in the deepest portion of the respiratory tree. These alveoli down here, they might be dealing with a partial pressure of oxygen that's only a half of what we get in the, uh, in the shallower portions of the respiratory tree. Now when we look at the respiratory anatomy of birds, we've got a completely different story. Okay? Uh, we have a system of air sacs. Uh, both anterior and posterior air sacs that receive the air from the outside world and transfer that inhaled air through the lungs. The air passes in through the trachea, it goes directly down to the posterior air sacs, and the air moves into the lungs from the posterior air sacs and it moves directly through to the anterior air sacs. And from these anterior sacs, the air gets exhaled out. It actually takes two breaths for a volume of air to get all the way through the avian respiratory tree. Okay. In the first inhale, we fill the posterior air sacs. When the bird exhales, it's the anterior air sacs that get emptied to the outside world. It's during this exhalation stroke where the lungs are actually being filled by the air from the posterior air sacs. And then the next time the bird inhales, the air from the lungs moves into the anterior air sacs, and then finally it goes to the outside. Okay. Now this two-stroke system in avian lungs results in a through-flow ventilation. And this is going to be highly consequential when it comes to the partial pressure of oxygen in the air spaces of the lungs of the birds. Okay, now in the case of birds, we don't call them alveoli because an alveolus, which you find in mammals, is a simple sac. Okay? In the case of birds, we call them parabronchi, parabronchus for singular, and the air flows in one side and out the other. Okay? The pulmonary capillaries are flowing in close proximity to the parabronchi. Not surprisingly, they flow in the opposite direction relative to the airflow through the parabronchus. Okay. Why would they do that? What do we call that? You should know the answer. Now again, this is a big deal in our lessons on respiratory physiology because of the consequences that it has for the overall ability of the avian lung to take in oxygen. Uh, because of this through-flow system, we're, we're basically bringing in um, a much higher partial pressure of oxygen into the airspace of the parabronchus. The uptake of oxygen is going to be occurring at a much, much faster rate in the avian lung than is ever going to be possible in the case of a mammalian lung. Okay? And of course this makes sense, right? Most birds are capable of metabolic activity, powered flight, that is not achieved in any of the mammal species. And not only that, there are lots of species of birds that are capable of, of flying, even at those high altitudes where the thinness of the air would make it really hard to stay aloft, as well as making it really hard to access the oxygen that's there. Let's take a look at the respiratory tree of a typical bird. This is a duck. Okay? And uh, in the top picture, what we've done to this duck is kind of the same thing that we did to that poor guy in my first picture of a respiratory tree. We pumped up its respiratory tree full of blue rubber. Um, only in this case, we basically had to push in a whole lot of rubber. We had to push in a whole lot of that blue latex because we're filling not only the bronchi and the parabronchi of the lungs, we're also filling those anterior and posterior air sacs. And so the posterior air sacs go all the way out to the butt end of the bird. And you can see the anterior air sacs, those blue spaces, you have quite a bit in the thoracic cavity of the bird. And you also have quite a bit in specialized spaces that occur in the neck vertebrae. Right? 
Now, a flying animal obviously is, is going to take benefit from minimizing overall body weight. And having lots of air spaces inside of your body cavity is, is definitely going to be helping there. Uh, not only that, the bird bones, even their long bones, tend to be highly pneumatized. They're, uh, they're not solid, they're not heavy bones, they tend to be really lightweight bones. Most of the bones comprised of air spaces. Once you get past that shell on the outside of a chicken bone, there's a lot of air spaces inside of that. The other thing that we see in the case of bird skeletons is that in their neck vertebrae, there are these pretty substantially sized voids, spaces, that accommodate anterior air sacs. Okay? And this is not just a matter of trivia. I bring this up because somebody's always going to ask the question, how does this information play out as we try to understand the physiology and metabolic activity and maybe even the behaviors of dinosaurs? Okay. Because if you look at the skeleton in some of birds' uh, close relatives, sort of close relatives, theropod dinosaurs, uh, if you look at this T-Rex, one thing that's pretty interesting is that in the, uh, in the neck vertebrae of T-Rex, we've got some pretty large empty spaces, pretty, uh, pretty big gaps that would best be explained by the existence of anterior air sacs in the respiratory anatomy of the T-Rex. Uh, this reconstruction basically has dinosaurs with the same type of two-stroke respiratory tree that we find in birds. This would suggest what about the metabolic potential of dinosaurs? Is it more consistent with them being fast, active predators? Or would it be more consistent with the older picture of dinosaurs as slow and lumbering behemoths of the Mesozoic?